Thank you. Um, President Zimmer, provosts, deans, colleagues, families and friends of our students, and other distinguished guests, good morning. And of course, dear graduating students, congratulations. Preparing for this speech has been stressful. My eczema even flared up this quarter. All this extra stress, I soon realized, had much to do with the low expectations I had as to how well an economist, no, scratch that, an economist working in the business school was going to be received. All of the picketing that has been taking place outside of my building over the last few months sure did not help raise my low expectations. The broader public does not trust economists. A recent poll reveals that only 25% of people trust us. That is in contrast with an 82% trust level in doctors and 71% in historians. It is, only thanks <laughs> it is only thanks to politicians that we escape the bottom of the list. <laughs> some of this distrust and sometimes outright dislike for economists comes, I believe, from a misunderstanding of what economists study and teach. For too many, economics is equated to a toolbox of tricks masquerading as a science that teaches people in firms how to make as much money as possible at whatever cost to society. If you are graduating today with an economics degree, and if this is what you think economics is about, it's not too late to ask for your money back. <laughs> if you are graduating with an economics degree or a business degree or really any degree, I sure hope that you understand that misleading and cheating should never be part of your job description. Nothing good happens either to our economy or our society when businesses flourish because they cheat while other businesses struggle because they remain honest. And yes, you have a choice. You can exert voice, be an active agent for cultural change when you see this culture lacking at your place of employment. You can also vote with your feet and exit if the culture is not right and not fixable. I understand this is easy for me to say as I'm not staring at years of student debt. But trust me, there are many good jobs out there that will not conflict with your moral compass and a little pay cut will be well worth sleeping better at night. Whatever you choose, voice or exit, always remember that you have a choice. But of course, this is not what economics is. Economics studies how people and firms make choices under constraints. These constraints derive from the fact that the resources that we have as a society are limited. There are only that much natural resources, physical capital, human capital, and time to spread around. Given this, Economists tend to focus most of their attention on efficiency considerations. Given the limited resources that we have, how do we best allocate them to maximize people's well-being? We love markets because markets, with appropriate safeguards, can be truly transformative in this quest for efficiency. More sophisticated critics of economics dislike how discipline dehumanizes people. We treat people, the argument goes, as hyper-rational, utility-maximizing robots, and base our derivation of what is and what is not efficient, relying on models that are fundamentally flawed given the unrealistic assumptions they make about how people make choices. This hyper-rational view of human decision-making does not reflect the field of economics today. Put more humbly, economists have realized their mistakes and now embrace rather than dismiss the other social sciences. After multiple Nobel Prizes celebrating behavioral economics, it is now apparent, even to outsiders, that economics has converged towards a more realistic view of how people make decisions. They are lazy, they have self-control problems, and they're really not that good at statistics. <laughs> Beyond the transformational imports from cognitive psychology via the work of Richard Thaler and others, Sociology and social psychology have also reshaped economics. Indeed, our understanding of human behavior becomes more complete when we are willing to accept that people care about what others think of them, that their well-being might be a reflection of not just how much money and leisure they have, but also of how they fare compared to others, and how their choice and circumstances map into their social identity. As fourth-generation coal miners that have been raised to view themselves as the main providers for their family, as African-American boys trying to fit in in the most violent neighborhoods of Chicago. It is true that the economics that we practice today 
with all these imports from psychology and sociology, is less disciplined than it was in the past. It is messier, less model-centric, and less theory-driven. But there's no doubt in my mind that this diminished rigor has come with the benefit of greater realism and an increased likelihood that we are getting some of it right. It is definitely in this messier type of economics that I feel comfortable. Another criticism of economics, and the one I want to focus on for the remaining of this speech, is related to economists' supposed lack of concern for distributional issues. While economists care about efficiency and value creation in society, they do not care about who benefits from the value that is created. And indeed, what is most efficient may sometimes, but not always, create greater inequalities. Globalization and trade are certainly today's leading example of the trade-offs between efficiency and distribution. It is true that some economists have strongly argued against economists studying distributional effects. One of my Nobel Prize winning colleagues famously said that nothing is as poisonous to sound economics as to focus on questions of distribution, questions that might be better left to other disciplines or political institutions. However, many economists are in fact very much concerned with distribution and inequality. I'm only one of a large contingent of scholars in economics department, public policy schools, and business schools who have been devoting much of their careers to measuring inequalities, understanding their causes, and studying solutions. In a nutshell, many economists are minding the gaps. To be clear, I do not think it requires extending beyond other economists' preferred focus on efficiency to make the case that inequality should be of concern to economics. This is because inequalities hurt efficiency. Let me explain. In some of my research, I've been measuring gender and racial inequalities in the labor market. Some facts are startling enough to be worth repeating. Only 25% of college-educated women working full-time in 2010 had earnings above the median of similarly educated men working full-time. Only 6% had earnings that put them in the top 20% of the men's distribution. In some of the work I did on racial inequality, I used a field experiment to show that job applicants with African-American sounding names receive 50% fewer callbacks for interviews than did job applicants with identical resumes but white sounding names. Since I completed this work, it has been replicated in many countries around the world, with each of these new studies documenting similar patterns of adverse labor market outcomes for the minority group in that country. North Africans in France, indigenous people of Australia, Mongolians and Tibetans in China, the list goes on. A recent study that mined hundreds of millions of US tax records show that large income disparities exist between white and black men even when they are raised in homes with the same income and the same family structure. There are many ways to argue as to why all these findings are troubling. Most outside of economics would say this is just simply unfair, a violation of equal rights. But it's not just a matter of fairness and justice and rights, it is also a matter of efficiency. Starting from the assumption that talent is equally distributed at birth between men and women, and ruling out that as the assumption that women are born with a comparative advantage in loading the dishwasher, changing diapers, or driving kids to soccer games, premises I firmly stand by, it has to be that as a society, we are leaving money on the table by having only, to use one of the most extreme examples, 5% of CEOs of Fortune 500 companies that are women. The same logic about the efficiency cost of inequality obviously also extends to racial inequality. My colleagues Eric Hurst and Cheng Tai Che have made this point forcefully in some of these, their recent work, where they show that a quarter of the growth that the US has experienced between 1960 and 2010 can be explained by the lowering over time of the barriers to entry for women and African Americans into occupations in which they had been previously underrepresented. Furthermore, and maybe more disturbing to the aforementioned argument that economics should focus solely on matters of efficiency and leave distribution questions to others, some of the higher income inequality that may be created by the more efficient policies may also ultimately hurt efficiency if this income inequality is accompanied by lower social mobility, as the data seems to suggest. Unequal societies might be losing out by precluding themselves from tapping into the talent of those who were born into the lower hand of the income distribution. What economics has given me in my quest to measure gender and racial inequalities 
is a healthy dose of skepticism against easy explanations for these inequalities. In particular, economists like to start from the prior that there is no free lunch out there. It's a useful prior. Why would farms that are trying to do the best they can with limited resources not hire the talented women and minorities whose talent is apparently undervalued by the market? For sure, employers should be jumping on this opportunity, and this would naturally reduce the gender and racial gaps in earnings. Maybe there are sexist and racist employers out there, but these employers would not survive in a competitive marketplace as they are paying more for the same talent by favoring white men in their hiring decisions. Taking this skepticism to the data it has, has led me to question a one-size-fits-all explanation for women's and minorities' underperformance in the labor market. When it comes to racial inequalities, I believe it is difficult to look at the body of research that has accumulated without acknowledging the central role of prejudice. But probably more common than explicit racism are the unconscious, implicit biases that induce even the best-intentioned employer to discriminate. In contrast, I do not believe that sexism in the workplace is the leading explanation as to why your mom's careers have on average not matched that of your dad's. Instead, I believe that the main explanation is you, graduates. Evidence that has now accumulated across countries show that college-educated women's careers essentially track that of their husband until the birth of the couple's first child. Mothers take a massive earnings hit right after that first birth, and their earnings never recover. Old school economics helped me make sense of this finding. The thinking is that optimizing couples face time constraints and benefit from having each spouse specialize, one in the labor market and the other one in childcare and home production. The messier economics that I feel comfortable in it helps me understand why it is the women that more often stake the labor market hit, even among couples where the allocation of labor market talent would ask for the woman to work and the man to stay home. The root is in slow-moving gender identity norms, transmitted from one generation to the next, norms that are lagging today's uh, distribution of human capital. These are norms about where men belong, primarily in the workplace, about which spouse can best provide for the children, or about whether a man can truly be a real man if he's all earned by his wife. I understand this view I have converged towards flies in the face of the current focus on sexual discrimination and worse, sexual harassment in the workplace. So let me be very clear. I'm in no way saying that sexual discrimination in the workplace does not exist. I'm convinced that there are women in this audience today that have experienced it. Through my service work over the last year for my own professional association, I've heard too many stories of women whose career got derailed because of sexist colleagues. This said, I doubt that solely eradicating gender discrimination in the workplace will erase the gender gap in earnings. It would be a mistake to direct all policy for efforts, be it corporate or public policy, to fixing the work environment when, I would argue, a key driver of the gender gap in Djibouti is rooted in the home, or more precisely, the intersection of the home and the work environment. Whatever you make of this, I have one small request to all of you. Give your mom a big hug. And to you, the young woman in the audience today, you should mind the gap as you take that crucial step from the platform to the train. You should mind the gap as you transition out of school and into building successful professional and personal lives. You should realize that these trade-offs between career and family still exist for you, even though they will undoubtedly be less pronounced in your generation than they were in mine. It would be presumptuous, I think, to simply assume that you can have it all career and family without being thoughtful about the choices you make, in particular in the marriage market. If you want to have it all, make sure to check your date's appetite for diaper duty and willingness to let you shine the brightest star at work that you want if this is what you want for yourself. This holds true even if your date looks like Ryan Gosling. In conclusion, I'm afraid that this speech did not deliver on the forever truths that are staples of commencement speech. I certainly did not share any secret formula on how to design a good life. I'm still looking for that formula for myself. But I will squeeze in some final, very cliched words of wisdom. It feels like yesterday that I was sitting in your chair, wide-eyed and ready to build my own professional and family life. So please believe me when I say 
time really does fly. You all have an exciting future in front of you. Make the most of every moment. Congratulations, class of 2018.